and welcome to the debate. I'm your Strafik Val, and in today's show, we'll be discussing how the U.S. has denied supporting or funding the Afghan Taliban. Of course, this comes uh, from the U.S. State Department, and which um, it, it's a it's a story of uh, the Doha Accord up till now, where the Doha three meetings were held recently, and of course, from the Doha Accord, when the Afghan Taliban regime. Um, they talked and made commitments uh, to the international community regarding how they would uphold human rights, uh, the basic international norms uh, such as women's rights to education, employment, uh, the inclusivity factor, and of course, uh, curbing the spread and not allowing uh, the militant outfits to use Afghan soil to carry out their nefarious terrorist agendas in the region. But uh, the Doha 3 talks were held recently in which uh, the international community urged the Afghan Taliban to uphold their commitments that they had made earlier, specifically regarding to women's education and employability rights. Uh, the Taliban regime, if we talk about how they have uh, been uh, coping up with their promises made, they have not been coming up to what they earlier committed. And uh, the regime is not ensuring a women's right to education, employment and inclusivity. And of course, there are multiple reports from international organizations on this and um, how the Afghan Taliban is curbing women's access to education, employability, even in uh, the healthcare sectors, the teaching sectors, th th those sectors uh, where it is uh, vital for women to uh, take part to address, um, to address the issues faced by the female population. Uh, in regards to that, uh, there's another element as well that, uh, that is uh, the security element in which how the militant outfits are using Afghan soil to carry out their nefarious designs in the region. And when we talk about the region, uh, Pakistan has time and time again said, the interior minister of the country has also said, and the foreign office has also urged the Afghan Taliban side to put an end to these militant outfits that are using the Afghan soil to carry out their attacks in the region and Pakistan as well. But uh, the matter still persists and lingers on and the international community is uh, trying to persuade the Taliban regime to take concrete action against the violations of the commitments they had made earlier and uh, action against those banned militant outfits using the Afghan soil. And in regards to that, the Doha 3 talks were held recently. Of course, uh, no breakthrough, um, no significant breakthrough as of yet, but dialogue uh, will uh, still continue. We'll be dif discussing the different aspects of uh, the U.S. statement in which it has denied supporting and funding the Afghan Taliban regime. Uh, to talk about all of this and uh, the different aspects, we have been joined in the studios by senior analyst Farooq Badafi. Along with that, we have been joined by geopolitical analyst Raja Faisal. And on Skype, we have been joined by Tariq Farhadi, who is an Afghan affairs expert. I'd like to thank you all for taking out time and being part of the conversation. I'll start off with Mr. Tariq Farhadi first, considering the situation in Afghanistan and how the international community is reacting to it. From the Doha three, uh, uh, from Doha Accord up till now, the Doha three meetings. Um, how do you think the international community has been playing its role in shaping up uh, the Afghan situation as it is now? Well, uh, good evening and uh, thanks uh, for inviting me uh, uh, with with good friends uh, in this um, interview. Um, uh, basically, um, the. United States is a major donor for Afghanistan, but through the United Nations. Uh, the reason for that is that Afghan Taliban are under sanctions, uh, Congress sanctions, U.S. Congress sanctions, and um, it's impossible to uh, give money to uh, people who are under sanctions. So uh, the solution that the U.S. Uh, State Department uh, has found is to give the money to the United Nations and the United Nations uh, is spending uh, those amounts um, in Afghanistan um, through its organizations, which is um, WFP, World Food Program, uh, WHO, World Health Organization, and other organizations, UNICEF. Uh, so uh, this is not the ideal situation, but um, we are stuck with this situation. And uh, I think as time goes, there's also a risk that the U.S. will fund uh, less and less uh, humanitarian aid to Afghanistan because um, in the last three years, other crises have uh, arisen uh, throughout the world where, where U.S. funding goes. I'm thinking about Ukraine. 
in regards to that. Uh, Raja Faisal, I'd also uh, like uh, your views um, when we talk about um, uh, the Afghan Afghanistan situation and uh, the international community, of course. Uh, the international community has time and time again urged the Afghan Taliban side uh, to come up to the norms that are known internationally, globally, um, and norms such as basic rights, um, inclusivity, and um, the issue of uh, security as well. Um, with that, how do you see the Afghan side coping up and coming up to the expectations by the international community because uh, these norms are valid throughout the world? Yeah, but Rafi, it's a good question and ob obviously this is what I was, uh, you know, obviously uh, thinking about and that is, uh, of course, if the money is being paid to uh, uh, Afghan Taliban, mm. uh, the ones who are ruling in Kabul, uh, that money is extended towards the, uh, the problems which are being faced by people at large of Afghanistan and that to me, I think it's a good step forward that they are being uh, given money. But at the same time, why not ensure that the women are getting their rights? Why not ensure mm. that the in inclusivity which was promised in Doha Accord, that should have been shown, uh, uh, you know, everywhere? Why not uh, make sure that uh, land of Afghanistan is not being used against any of the neighboring countries, including Pakistan, which is constantly being used and of course uh, their uh, you know provinces uh, they are still catering uh, quite a few uh, number a big number of uh, uh, outfits that are banned mm. in Pakistan that are banned in uh, Uzbekistan that are banned in uh, uh, Iran that are banned in China as well at the same time so if the money is being paid to uh, Taliban regime then it should have been made sure that the money which is being provided to uh, the Taliban, that money has a meaning. Hmm. And that money uh, has a meaning for not only Taliban, but of course people at large. And uh, who is going to ensure that the money is being spent on people of Afghanistan rather than simply, you know, paying off uh, 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 the, uh, the amounts or salaries to their own uh, uh, sort of uh, forces, the hmm. Taliban forces I'm talking about. So this is uh, the sort of, uh, you know, uh, dilemma which is being faced right now. And all I am worried about is that if money is being uh, getting into Afghanistan for the sake of people of Afghanistan, then the very people of Afghanistan deserve a right to, of course, send their daughters to the school. Hmm. Then the very people of Afghanistan deserve a right to education uh, at large and human rights. Then the very people are... Uh, you know, th they deserve a right to ask their own uh, government whether uh, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, whether the uh, country itself is being still used for uh, nurturing the terrorism or not. And mm. all of these questions and moreover, the, uh, uh, you know, inclusiveness of the government is it being insured or not, or is just the uh, one-sided government or one uh, uh, sort of uh, power that is of Taliban that is ruling over uh, over Afghanistan and the rest of uh, uh, the people who belong to different ethnicities, who belong to different, uh, of course, uh, you know, sects of uh, Islam, they are not being represented hmm. uh, in the <coughs> government quarters when it comes to, of course, Taliban regime. So people like, of course, uh, our very good friend, uh, uh, people like Tariq, who are still out of, uh, you know, the country, why they are not being uh, including, uh, included into the cabinet. Hmm. I mean, he is someone who has an extensive experience in, of course, representing his country, and he has in past represented his country at the best of the podiums mm. and to be honest he is someone who i would have always uh, wanted to see in, uh, 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 in the inclusiveness it. of uh, uh, afghanistan's yeah. government mm. and that is what is worrisome and it needs to be catered right uh, and uh, allow me to actually go back to tariq saab tariq mm. saab you are not merely an analyst you are also a visionary and you have helped us understand many issues now, when you look at the circumstances in Afghanistan, there seems to be a regime which is immovable, uh, which uh, people cannot actually change, and they cannot even influence. On the other side, the circumstances are such that if you try to punish that regime, you end up punishing the people because then it becomes a crisis of food, it becomes a poverty crisis, so many others. Uh, and on, the, on top of all this, it seems that the world community 
does not have wherewithal or the will to uh, go for some kind of correction in the country, uh, does it look to you as, a, as an impossible problem? Uh, is it a paradox? And is there, in your mind, is there a solution at all? First of all, thank you very much the, for the nice words towards me. Uh, you know, Afghanistan um, is a very young country. Uh, the average age uh, uh, probably is uh, um, around 40 years old. Uh, uh, people die sooner because there is no uh, medical help. But when you see the images of Afghanistan in every tent and every refugee tent, you see uh, one couple having seven children. That's why the uh, age pyramid in Afghanistan is, is low. So at my age, I think I have passed the, the time of any leadership in Afghanistan. It belongs to the young generation to find a solution from within Afghanistan. But I think that the only solution is uh, some sort of a evolution from within the Taliban ranks, uh, because the, uh, those uh, who are outside or, or, or only um, uh, speaking, and the Taliban are not listening to anybody. And lately, the Taliban have turned very unpredictable as well. Uh, in terms of, uh, um, we don't know now uh, where the power is. Uh, is it in Kabul? Is it in Kandahar? We think it's in Kandahar. Uh, the people in Kabul are in power, but they're not criticizing uh, the harsh decisions of the emir regarding uh, uh, the privation of women from uh, school and, uh, and work. Uh, so it's a very strange situation. There is not enough uh, proven, enough proven information on where the power is within the Taliban. But we think that over the three years, uh, instead of improving so that these problems that we just mentioned um, unlock, it has become more mysterious and complicated uh, uh, on the human rights front, on the fact that Taliban do not um, uh, make public their financial budget, their government budget, on the fact that uh, non-Taliban are not included in decision making. So you can see that Taliban, if you compare it to a political party, that means that one political party called Taliban has uh, taken the power in Afghanistan and everybody else is out uh, in terms of where the country needs to go. And uh, there is not a lot of vision on the part of uh, uh, the current Amir of the Taliban on uh, where uh, uh, the country can go if the schools are closed and the girls are not educated. I hear that the, uh, the refugees from Pakistan, one of the key points they don't want to return to Afghanistan is that their daughters are studying in schools in Pakistan and in Afghanistan the schools are closed for their daughters. So this, these tensions uh, exist in, in, uh, in Afghanistan. So now, what is the solution? The solution needs to be peaceful uh, because Afghanistan has been at war, civil war, internal war for the past 50 years. Um, elements within the Taliban need to be identified that want to reform. If they can reform, if they can uh, come out and uh, uh, say that uh, they are ready to reform, open the schools, I think the people of Afghanistan will, by and large, not everyone maybe, but by and large, uh, will, will um, uh, become allies of those reformers that could open schools, that could give other uh, religious uh, sects within Afghanistan access to the decision-making spheres. Uh, uh, so it's complicated, but it might take time, and I hope that it, the situation doesn't become worse. But the, if there is one sliver of optimism, is how to find the elements within the Taliban who are ready to reform, and do they have the wherewithal to oppose their leader, uh, or uh, that their leader might change uh, to another leader who uh, could be more open to modern uh, modern uh, governance. Um, even the Organization of Islamic States um, or Islamic countries, OIC, has not recognized the Taliban so long as uh, they keep the girls' uh, schools uh, closed. 
but uh, Tarek said, <laughs> here's, here's a counter argument of what you were saying. And that is, of course, peaceful solution is the uh, best solution possible. But peace usually takes a lot of time. And when you're talking about evolution, here's uh, Afghanistan, in Afghanistan, particularly in Afghan Taliban, it is one word that defies any logic. It doesn't seem to work. Uh, they were in power for five years, but we did not see any, any evolution at all. And this time also, they have been in power for three years, but we haven't seen any progress. People keep on talking about it, but international community does not seem to have any kind of sway. So uh, uh, do you think that any group of people within the organization who want to reform will get any kind of positive deception? So um, you are absolutely right that if we leave the country as it is, there is more chance of the situation uh, uh, to deteriorate, uh, even violence to erupt in some ways, uh, than to improve. Uh, I would say that uh, the experiences of the first term of Taliban, you mentioned the first five years, and the experience of the last three years that we have had, they don't have, the Taliban don't have the capacity to improve in terms of uh, governance, in terms of arriving to a point where uh, they can be acceptable to the international community and to the uh, people of Afghanistan uh, in terms of their hopes and aspirations of education, of the women uh, having uh, access to educational institutions, as in Pakistan and other Islamic countries. Uh, left alone, the Taliban have demonstrated that they don't have the ability to improve uh, but there is a risk uh, that the situation deteriorates. That's absolutely right. Um, the international community has forgotten about Afghanistan. It has um, uh, its own interests in Afghanistan, which they are defending. But the issues of human rights um, are no longer really important uh, to the international community in Afghanistan. And to some extent, the Taliban have convinced uh, representatives of the international community that some uh, way of life or customs of the people of Afghanistan um, are not to send their girls to school, which is wrong. I think Afghanistan in, in the past 50 years um, has had schools, universities, women, uh, doctors, engineers, and also women in politics. Uh, and I think uh, within the framework of an Islamic uh, country, like any other 50-some uh, Islamic countries that, that are around the world. Afghanistan is the only country that forbids uh, women participation in government and in education, which really threatens the future of the country. And, and also creates another push for people to want to migrate af from Afghanistan because uh, uh, there is no perspective for the, for the families that have daughters. Uh, people who have daughters who are 12, 13 years old, um, education stops for them. And that is really uh, the point that, that uh, uh, Afghans, as we are doing, should lobby the international community to, uh, to uh, push Taliban. The Taliban are under sanctions uh, already. Um, there, are not, there isn't too much more to do with them, but to uh, find elements that can create this, this, uh, this uh, uh, subgroup within the Taliban that would be interested in working with other Afghan leaders and would be interested in uh, acquiring uh, international recognition for the country, which is important because um, for the region, uh, Central Asia, Pakistan, uh, Central Asia wants to be linked to Pakistan and Pakistan wants to be linked to Central Asia, but because Afghanistan is not recognized, no international organization can finance any big projects in Afghanistan. In the last three years, nobody has invested any major amount of money in mining in Afghanistan. Nobody has invested uh, any major uh, amount of money in, in uh, infrastructure projects in Afghanistan that could link Central Asia to uh, Pakistan with all the population that uh, needs uh, electricity uh, and other resources. Uh, because Afghanistan's ta Taliban's Afghanistan's are under sanctions. I'm thinking also about the TAPI project, uh, 
Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India. Even if we don't do the India part, the TAP project, there is no investments on it because Afghanistan, uh, Taliban are under sanctions and international organizations cannot finance these projects. So within the Taliban, we have... Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. The, the, the Sensitive. Please. Brother, Brother Tarek, uh, when obviously, you know, you were talking about, uh, uh, of course, the different factions within uh, Taliban, uh, I somehow, of course, have an interaction with you. And uh, I could, of course, uh, tell you this, that yes, there are, uh, uh, there are people within Taliban who have a time to time studied and studied up till you know a very higher level in Pakistan's universities and in uh, even in Kabul University as well they have studied from there so they have people within themselves who are very enlightened who are very uh, well educated and when we of course debate with them on the issue of uh, you know uh, women education and women rights and human rights overall then they do agree with us but at the same time they keep on highlighting one aspect and that is related to of course the uh, you know uh, clerics the clerics are the ones who have the ultimate power within uh, in their hands because they are the ones who are uh, you know controlling uh, uh, the sympathies of the people and um, that sympathy that is obviously for the taliban because they believe that they have fought uh, for 20 years for uh, the freedom of the country and that is what is going on right now in there but i agree with you that there is a faction that of course believes in uh, modernism that believes in of course uh, uh, you know uh, taking the country going ahead with a positive uh, uh, sort of uh, you know uh, framework and positive mindset and them people of course they don't see a sort of their own leadership uh, uh, sort of uh, you know uh, popping up from anywhere wouldn't it be very good that people who are in exile like yourself and many more voices i keep on hearing them voices and i get attracted towards their voices who can ensure the inclusiveness of afghanistan and at the same time shouldn't be shouldn't it be like a political block in exile who is not doing criticism just for the sake of criticism and criticism against the mullahism and that criticism should be a constructive criticism on the basis of uh, uh, you know making afghanistan better than it has ever been before and not repeating the mistakes that have been you know uh, of course committed in the uh, in the post 1996 era and of course <coughs> them mistakes they led to a disaster shouldn't it be like this that there should be a political block in exile uh, of people like yourself and many more who are in the west who are in uh, uh, americas or canada they can play their role a constructive role rather than taking up guns this time you can take up your pens you can take up uh, you can use your uh, of course uh, influence to influence that block within taliban that is of course wanting their country to get towards the right path wouldn't it be a good idea and add to this a uh, very simple uh, solution that that you can offer uh, if such a group uh, in exile is formed uh, last time remember when taliban were in power at least on ground we had northern alliance that was fighting them this time we don't have any pushback mm. at all mm. so what kind of leverage would such a an exiled group have uh, especially in a field where uh, uh, Afghan Taliban leadership does not want to pay any heed to world or exiled uh, leaders' opinion. Uh, so I think the, 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 there are these voices, perhaps not in a block, but um, 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 here and there we see people uh, uh, calling on Taliban uh, to reform. Uh, I have always done this on Afghan TV, uh, very strangely enough, up to now. Uh, I'm invited on Afghan TV shows, and, and I can see these things. And the Taliban are listening to this, but they are not reacting. Beyond that, it's very difficult to get close to the Taliban because uh, they have to show that uh, they are make, taking the steps uh, to bring about change. If they don't show to bring about change, 
uh, it would be premature to to uh, get close to the Taliban. But through the television, because um, there are talk shows in Afghanistan, um, and they can invite uh, people who are not attacking uh, the Taliban directly, but can say things. Uh, th that we have been saying here, we can still say them <laughs> in Afghan TV right now. And the Taliban are just uh, tolerating uh, from some people this kind of uh, um, discourse uh, and uh, not from others, but even from us that we see it and they tolerate, uh, it hasn't had any effect because in the last three years we have done this, but there is no sign that one faction of Taliban is now um, able to uh, challenge the leadership in Kandahar. That sign is not there. One of the reasons is that uh, Kandahar is dividing uh, the um, uh, government resources for all the Taliban in a way that everybody is satisfied. Uh, Afghanistan has customs revenues uh, because uh, import and export is taxed and those customs reviews are divided between the Taliban leaders. So far, this division has been done in a way that nobody has protested. You know, a lot of these wars are about finances as well. And so the Taliban who are perhaps even not feeling very comfortable with the leadership's decisions in Kandahar, they still get the share of financial resources uh, allotted to them from Kandahar, and they're comfortable now in nice villas in Kabul, and they don't see the need for change. But now what we need to give them as an idea is that they have a responsibility to take the country to another level, take it out of the crisis after all these years of uh, war, get it to a point where the schools are open for girls, and Afghanistan reaches international recognition at the United Nations, and then it can play the part that it must play in the region of, uh, of, of uh, uh, transit trade and connection between uh, Central Asia and uh, South Asia, let's say, uh, especially Pakistan, which needs the resources of Central Asia, and the Central Asians' resources are locked up, and the Uzbekistan uh, government is trying a lot on this, but the Taliban are tone deaf uh, in Kabul and in Kandahar. But, um, am I, uh, sorry to cut you, but uh, am I correct in assuming that those conscientious or smart uh, Taliban people who might be there are getting enough graft or enough uh, uh, bribe to actually stay complacent in the system? Is it what you are saying, sir? The, the, uh, there's major risks for them to break uh, out of the ranks of the Taliban regime, basically, even if they are Taliban. Um, uh, not only uh, they receive the financing from their leader uh, to have a comfortable life and, and have leadership posts, but even that has been unpredictable because the leader of Taliban every now and then uh, um, um, changes people's uh, government positions and uh, basically leadership out of the Kandahar region, uh, the Emir has grown mostly unpredictable. The fact that uh, uh, highest levels of uh, um, um, United Nations representatives have traveled to Afghanistan, they have not been able to visit the Emir. And also uh, Mr. Ishaq Dar, uh, uh, Foreign Minister of Pakistan, uh, Deputy Prime Minister, is going to travel to Afghanistan in the next few days. It is not sure that he will meet the Emir of the Taliban. So it's a very difficult to deal with a country where uh, the leader is invisible. Right. Well, Fadafi, I'd, uh, I'd also like your views uh, since um, where, how the conversation has shaped up. Uh, with the Taliban regime being adamant on their own code of morality or values, um, and uh, the current U.S. stance on not supporting or funding the Afghan Taliban regime. Uh, what future aspects and prospects do you, uh, do you see regarding uh, future humanitarian and development funding? All right. Um, I think that before we speak about that, I just wanted to actually comment on the American uh, you know, uh, statement mm. that we started with initially in the program. There's a context to that. Before this, there were, uh, you know, speculations and reports from ex-CIA officials 
that uh, the U.S. has been paying a uh, hefty sum to Afghan Taliban on a regular basis. So this is a kind of rebuttal of that. Right. right. And uh, imp it is important because then you realize that somebody is paying them. And then you have to ask who is paying them, right? How mm -hmm. can you survive otherwise? Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, their own currency was patented in Europe. Mm -hmm. So who is patenting their, uh, their currency? How it gets to Afghanistan? How is Afghani, the currency, uh, stable? St it is more stable than Pakistan's currency. How does the economy work? All these questions are very important. Nobody mm. seems to ask these questions, mm. at least on international scene. Now, uh, going back to this bribe idea, I just was thinking, and it is me as a citizen, as a normal person, a uh, citizen of the world, that if somebody can be bought by the system, and they can be given enough, uh, enough uh, moolah to actually cooperate with the system, why can't they be actually given more money by other forces, international forces, to overthrow the system, at least the um, status quo? But that doesn't seem to be happening. I think truly, mm. uh, 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 Tariq Saab was saying that Afghan leader is invisible. I think what has happened is that Afghanistan somehow has uh, uh, borne this uh, cloak of invisibility. Now people pretend all over the world that there is a country called Afghanistan, there is um, an Afghanistan shape, a shaped hole uh, in the world's geography. So mm. my humble submission is one, this situation is not tenable because you cannot keep on waiting for some kind of uh, change in the system. Mm. Uh, there will have to be some kind of inducement. Without that, no direction can be changed. Uh, human life is long, one Amir is there, then there's going to be another Amir. What are you going to do if the next Amir is going to have the same kind of world view? And uh, given that without that, all international community is not going to cooperate with Afghanistan, minus few people, perhaps intelligence organizations that are mm -hmm. offering some kind of inducement, what becomes the future? of the common man on the street. And by the way, I, my heart goes out to Afghan uh, people, particularly Afghan daughters, because for 20 years, because there was this bubble during um, uh, Karzai's, uh, Karzai's time and Ashraf Ghani's time, people thought that there is a possibility that this becomes a new normal, hmm. where you can go to university, where you can work. And mind you, that m around 50% at least, or perhaps more than that, is either underage or closer to 20, right, in Afghanistan. And these are the people who were born during this duration. Mm. And for them to actually contend with that kind of horrible situation, when your ultimate villain, the ultimate fear actually becomes your everyday reality, is mind-boggling. Mm. And with that kind of situation, I. I don't know what to do. Yeah, I, I keep on trying to offer arguments, but I, at that time also I was repeatedly saying that, mind you, it is a point of no return. Once you cross this line, then there is no going back. Mm. And now I don't see any reset button there. This is frustrating. Right, Mr. Tariq, how, uh, in light of uh, what uh, Farouk Badafi had to say, um, do you think the Afghan Taliban needs to mend its ways? And of course, if it does, in your opinion, how do you think it can incorporate their morality code or their uh, code of uh, conduct that they have um, with regards uh, to the international norms known globally and uh, what, uh, the, or what the international community is also pursuing them to uphold? In small steps, basically, uh, now the country is in a situation that uh, if any change needs to come, uh, it has to come peacefully and not uh, uh, through another civil war, because another civil war will have uh, repercussions and consequences uh, for the neighbors of Afghanistan, including Pakistan. So uh, this reform that we are talking about um, can be encouraged by neighbors of Afghanistan as well. Uh, by identifying uh, those Taliban that are um, ready to um, uh, take uh, reforms in steps. That example is that uh, to open the schools in big cities, in Kabul, 
uh, in um, Mazar Sharif, which whichever city which which feels ready uh, to open the schools for girls, uh, that would be a very good signal for the international community. Uh, it will enable the United Nations to uh, uh, to engage uh, in a in a different way. Uh, um, so uh, the the point is, who are the Taliban elements who? are willing to take these steps, but they have enough power also to take these steps and, and uh, uh, for the Emir in Kandahar to tolerate these changes. But, uh, um, you know, uh, the, the clerics also have a role because all the clerics in Afghanistan don't think the same way that girls should sit at home. Uh, there are clerics that are uh, at the level of clerics in uh, Pakistan or Iran or Turkey or Saudi Arabia who uh, uh, see uh, their own daughters going to school in their own countries. And it, it's very possible that we can return to that situation. But if we can unlock the situation, uh, I think we would avoid a deterioration of the situation in Afghanistan. A deterioration of the situation in Afghanistan where Afghanistan is in, um, uh, forgotten and under the 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 uh, authoritarian uh, rule of an emir uh, will have negative consequences um, uh, for uh, neighbors of Afghanistan, for Pakistan as well. Uh, we see TTP being active uh, and uh, who to talk to uh, inside Afghanistan to control TTP. Uh, yes, uh, uh, the traditional minister of interior, etc., to talk to, to influence TTP, but there has to be more reform, there has to be more outreach, there has to be more incentives for things to change, and uh, to, that Afghanistan comes out of the crisis, with it, uh, the crisis of TTP, uh, uh, to calm down uh, so that uh, Pakistan also can attract investments from China and, and other uh, big countries. Uh, the region needs investments anyways. Afghanistan, Pakistan, we need to modernize a lot of our infrastructure. Exactly. Uh, obviously, Brother Tariq, when uh, you were talking about uh, who can, of course, bring this change, uh, I, of course, uh, I remember when I had the meeting uh, with uh, uh, key officials from, uh, uh, of course, Taliban side, and in that meeting, what I was told by them, that they will be introducing uh, a same school for uh, male and female both, but of course, in the mornings, uh, morning classes would be for the females and the afternoon classes would be for the male students, uh, obviously in the same school. This is what uh, why their, they, their view was. Why? There, there are girls' schools already, which are separate. There, there are. There are. At ba no point there was total co-education. -edu basically, basically the what, they were, what they were trying to maintain is that they, uh, they are short of staff. Mm. And uh, that short of staff and short of resources, resources can be covered like this, that they, th the schools, the same schools and same staff can be utilized for male and female at the same time. And then when they talked about certain issues related to, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, females, especially the widows, they forced to get married within the family of the deceased. I mean, that they are going to, of course, uh, you know, abolish from the practices to, uh, uh, of course, uh, give uh, rights to females. And this is what I, w I was being told <coughs> by them at that time. And when I asked them <coughs> about their supporting uh, Tehreek e Taliban Pakistan, then, of course, they said that uh, Mullah uh, Akhun Zada, uh, he himself, in one of the Friday sermons, he actually uh, gave a fatwa saying that whoever is, of course, attacking in Pakistan, brotherly country like Pakistan, they are actually doing a, 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 a haram. It is not allowed in uh, Islam to, of course, do that, to, of course, attack. To me, I think either TTP does not listen to uh, the Mullah Akhunzada at all, or if they do listen to these things, uh, from coming from uh, you know uh, Friday sermons of uh, Mullah Khun Zada, then they don't don't pay any heed to it because they internally know that is just the lip word and it has no meaning at all, and they can carry on whatever they are doing. And uh, behind the curtains, everyone is same. It's just the uh, on the screen of it, they are just trying to portray as if they are different from the previous ones. So to me, I think to show to the world they have a different view and. 
internally they have you know their own agenda which they are running and they are keeping this going knowing the facts that if they keep on going like this then they are open to different stakeholders different uh, uh, you know uh, spooky agencies as well who can of course spend a bit of money in their country and of course very recently uh, Sarah Adam he ha she has highlighted she's been of course ex CIA she has highlighted that uh, India is of course investing money in there hmm. and there are uh, few of the key figures who are close to the leadership of uh, Taliban TTA who are actually getting money and 10 million dollars is the amount she has already highlighted to carry on all of these activities in Pakistan against CPAC, against Chinese uh, working in Pakistan so that with one arrow they can uh, of course hurt both of the countries. And, and could you also comment on the uh, Jekyll and Hyde kind of uh, a deal with the uh, Mullah Khumzada's uh, fatwas mm -hmm. because it seems that occasionally uh, Tariq Saab he says one thing of course there are filters we don't know the entire story but then we hear something exactly opposite to what he earlier said and that also stays yeah the, the fact is that uh, we don't know the power where the power is and where is more power and uh, when is the point where somebody will challenge Ahunzada, uh, or do otherwise, or e either way, you see? But the point is that the last three years, the Taliban have lost credibility. They have lost credibility with the international community. They have lost credibility with the, with the young girls who are waiting for their schools to be open. For us, that we are calling for the schools to be open, and at the beginning they have said it will be open. Even symbolically, they have not opened two schools, you see. The staffing challenges could be resolved. It's a question of organization. There are enough women teachers in Kabul, but they have not done it. And with that, they have lost credibility. And vis-a-vis uh, -vis Pakistan, this situation, relationship with Pakistan has become very difficult uh, right now. It has become uh, perhaps one of the most difficult relationships that Pakistan has with a neighbor. Uh, so, uh, we have to find within the Taliban the interlocutors that are credible, that are willing to take bold steps uh, to take the country out of the crisis with the neighbors, within itself, and uh, save the future of the young population of Afghanistan that we mentioned, the, the pyramid of age that in every tent you see seven children. If they are not going to school, uh, this is going to be a tragedy for Afghanistan, but also for the region. One thing, uh, Rafi, and I have to actually say it, because uh, this girl issue is a very emotional issue for hmm. me. Um, I'm sure that most of us who are blessed with children have daughters as well. I have two, and they're apple of my eyes, and they are like a uh, delight of our life, right? They are, they are chatterboxes, they keep on talking and always get it. And I occasionally think that if, God forbid, a day comes when they are not allowed this kind of freedom, like going out, like studying, like meeting their friend, what kind of, you know, behavior they will manifest. Mm -hmm. And uh, that frustration kept, um, uh, you know, kept me up at least in the first six months, one year of the Taliban takeover until I went to the cardiac ward and I had to actually be treated there. Mm. So I think that it is something that we all need to mull about. Mm. And it is very important that we disengage this issue from everything else, mm. national security, mm. economy, others, because women's rights, children's rights are very important. Yeah. Uh, Rafi, I just wanted to include one more thing. Of course, uh, earlier, Mashar Tarek, uh, he has, uh, you know, rightly pointed out that, of course, when we talk about, uh, you know, economic activity, uh, he has rightly pointed out about the TAPI or TAP. But mm. there is another thing which, from which, of course, uh, Taliban could benefit from, and that was an extension to CPAC. An exactly. extension to CPAC that actually goes through Afghanistan and connects CPAC with the mm. Central Asian Republics. And the major issue which Afghan population at large faces, and that is of not having an economic sort of activity that can generate jobs for them, that can ge generate 
sort of uh, revenues and of course uh, you know overall the economy can r can be uh, run in afghanistan to me i think if that was implemented that the uh, connection with the cpac and of course uh, other side is china and uh, china is going through pakistan and that is connected uh, with the central asian public going through afghanistan the, gen the generation of jobs generation of uh, you know uh, economic activity that would have solved all of the problems and the majority of the youthfuls who get attracted towards uh, extremism mm. and e eventually terrorism the biggest part is of course the economic uh, lack of uh, economic activity in Afghanistan that needs to be catered and I think uh, 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 brother Tariq was uh, very right about it that economy uh, needs to be fixed so that uh, we can move forward um, economy and education I'd like to uh, thank all of our panelists as uh, this was all that we have from the debate from today uh, Tariq Farhadi Afghan affairs expert thank you for being yeah. part of the conversation and giving us your valuable insights Senior Analyst Farouk Patafi and Geopolitical Analyst Roger Faisal, thank you both for being part of the conversation as well. We hope the Afghan Taliban is uh, successful in uh, tackling the challenges they face domestically. And of course, uh, they are also successful in creating this balance and, and, and creating an environment an inclusive environment that promotes uh, the people of Afghanistan and of course gives them the opportunity where they can also get on the path of progress. With that, we'll have to conclude today's show. Till tomorrow, take care.